Are you all ready to join me today in our trip to outer space? Come along quietly or not. I will talk to you about For there is nothing else. Some artists make it. Shows and you have to rehearse. And when you rehearse, Jenna would really like it. I would like it too. If you would read exactly what's on the cue cards, it's making everybody crazy. Can't do it. I'm an improviser. My acting style is like jazz. Jazz that you laugh at. But in there, but in there, but in there, but in Hello, folks. This is visual artist Albert Shivers, and you are listening to another episode of the Planet Shivers podcast recorded right here live on Planet Shivers. And did you know that here on Planet Shivers we actually still have dinosaurs? They never went extinct here. Here, I'll prove it to you. I'm going to open the window here for a second. See, you think coronavirus is bad. Try running from a friggin' T-Rex on your way to get a gyro. Anyway, I feel like I owe everybody a little bit of an explanation here. It's been like three weeks, almost, probably two and a half, three weeks since I put out a podcast, which they usually come out weekly. I put out my conversation with Sharon Preston Fulta and John Alexander if you missed it, Louis Armstrong's daughter. I put that out, and then I just disappeared for a while. And I've been disappearing lately. I had people call me out on it recently. I don't want to disappear no more. Sometimes you got to go in, you got to go deep into the murky waters for a bit and come out with some new ideas. So I'll fill you in on the past three or so weeks. I have not done a podcast since I had my big jazz related art show called jazz ain't dead at the create and be art studio the show went extremely well courtney and sylvia who run the studio they are they did a fantastic job they're fantastic they ran the tour for the show they interacted with the guests they did a great job getting attention to the show in the middle of a pandemic And a lot of people liked the art enough to bring some home with them, which was fantastic. Sold pieces, so it was a successful show all across the board, I have to say. And on top of everything else, a lot of people went to the show and left with an interest in the artists that were on the wall. The pictures that I drew of certain jazz artists, whether it was Adelaide Hall, who was a singer, Dorothy Donegan, the piano player, or the more popular ones even, Coltrane and Miles and Armstrong, Gillespie, Josephine Baker, all these names who people might have heard of before but didn't really know or never heard of before, they were interested and they were going to, told me anyway, they were going to go home and look into these artists which is pretty great. So that show was fantastic. I can't thank Courtney and Sylvia enough, and um, I'm going to be continuing to work with them a lot going forward. But the jazz show was fantastic. It felt really good, you know, when you see a little bit come back. Just like with Louis Armstrong's daughter, Miss Fulta, a couple of weeks ago. When you put so much work into something, whether it's this podcast or whether it is my visual art side of things, when you start to see things come back, when you see a room full of people into a thing that you're doing is fantastic. Because I got news for you, like with the art, I'd be doing it anyway. There's no, like, 
it might sound cold, but I can't think of any other way to put it. I don't think about an audience when I'm doing a piece of art. The main people who I want to like it are my friends. If they like it, I feel like I'm doing a good job. I feel like they're honest with me. They're the ones who I want them to look at it and enjoy it. If there's anybody that I try to please. But I don't even try to please. I just I'd want them to like it. People who are close to me. I want people who are close to me to like it. But I don't think about the audience. I'd be drawing anyway. I was drawing 24 hours a day over 10 years ago in my room alone with music playing. Nobody was seeing what I was doing then. Nobody. And if it was the case today, I'd still be drawing and no one would be seeing it. But to have strangers come, fill a room, to see my drawings, it's unbelievable. It's a tremendous feeling and I'm very thankful for having this show. Courtney filmed a lot of this show. Again, she's one of the people who run this gallery. She is a curator. Art is her life. She eats, sleeps, and breathes it. She took a lot of film of the show, and she interviewed guests of the show. I'm compiling all that footage into a short video, six, seven minutes. I'll be throwing it on the Albert Shivers YouTube channel. And the YouTube channel is going to be getting a little bit of a, some plastic surgery. And so is my social media. I'm working with an art manager now. And I'm going to revamp my Instagram. Going to revamp the Facebook. Going to really get social media. I'm going to be social on social media. I'm going to get a bigger presence. Slim it down. Give it a little bit of a facelift. It'll be like Vivica Fox before and after. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go Google it. It's going to be a little bit tighter, a little bit more together. It may not be as fun, but it'll also be a little bit wider. So keep an eye out for that on YouTube. I'm just going to run through them. It's just Albert Shivers. The same thing on Facebook. And on Instagram, it's at Albert Shivers. You'll see new art, past art, interesting things that I'm up to. We're trying to get that follower count up. Um, see what we could do. See how much, see how many marshmallows we could throw at the wall here, and see how much, how integrated into into the world, into society, my art can become. Because I think there's a lot of people who haven't seen it that might like it. I don't know, and people say it's good, so I'm gonna take their advice and not get down on myself about it. But on the topic of art. And the topic of this whole episode. So, in the Mothers of Invention album, their first album, Freak Out, inside the album, if you were to open it up, or the CD, open it up, there's a list called the Freak Out list. This was a list of all the influences that influenced the band. Names, whether it was... Other musicians, artists, actors, people in their lives, whatever it was, was this big list. So, a number, number of years ago, I decided to make my own list of my own influences. I thought it would be a fun thing to do to compile this list, really for nobody but me, to have it, to look at every once in a while, maybe be reminded of someone on that list who I hadn't been thinking about recently and go check out their artwork. So on this episode, you're just you're stuck with just me. It's gonna be a, I'm gonna be flying solo. I am looking for a regular co-host, so that'll be coming up soon. I'm gonna have news on that very soon. I'm gonna get myself an Ed McMahon here, or if you listen to Joey Diaz's podcast, I'm gonna get myself a Lee, or I'll get myself a Jamie if you're into Joe Rogan. So we're gonna we're gonna get somebody in here. For me to bounce things off of, for them to bounce things off me, to really, so I'm not sitting here pretty much talking to the wall. But I'm, you know, I assume I'm talking to somebody. You're listening, so I'm talking to you then. So there is going to be a lot of new things coming up on all fronts for me. The podcast, the Instagram, Facebook, all the social medias, it's 
everything's going to blow up. We're going to be putting a lot of work into things here to make it more enjoyable for anybody who's interested in checking out the stuff. So head over there as soon as you can after this is over. On this episode, I'm going to be going through what I call my shivers list. 30 names. I was very specific on who went up there. You can't put everybody on the list. So right now there are 30 names and I'm going to go through some more detailed than others. And they're going to be in predominantly alphabetical order um, as to not give any any one any favoritism than the other. So we will get to that list now right after a word from a Planet Shiver sponsor. This holiday, buy gefilte fish in gleaming glass jars, made in the finest tradition of Passover under strict rabbinical supervision. Delicately light, always right. Gefilte fish in jars. Choose your favorite brand at your local food market. A message from the Specialty Foods Trade Institute. Okay, folks. So first on, just this microphone a little bit here. First on the shivers list, is Howard Louis Bluey Armstrong. Now, Howard Armstrong was not only a visual artist, but he was also a blues musician, a folk blues musician of the 1930s into the 40s. He did a lot of amazing recordings. He was part of the Tennessee Chocolate Drops, which was... Um, a four or five piece band from back in the day they were a string band and they recorded a lot of really cool tunes but their first their first big tune was called State Street Rag that was their hit that's the song that shows up on all the compilations that kind of thing but at a young age, Howard Armstrong also did visual art. He first started doing his visual art by taking like colored paper and wetting it and squeezing the ink out of paper and out of other things to almost make like watercolors. And he would paint with watercolors. His main deal was he did like caricatures. He did all sorts of things like that. And he also, which is very interesting, painted his own history. So in other words, he would do images of where he grew up. He would do images of areas that he would visit. All kinds of different things. And he would do these things from memory. You know, they were naturally olden days. They were not a wealthy family. So they didn't have the means to take pictures of everything. So Howard Armstrong had such a good memory and such a good visual memory and a way to, excuse me, a way to remember it and visualize it right onto the page is pretty unbelievable and when you watch the movie, so now Terry Zweigoff, who is also a old music aficionado, a film director, he directed the Crumb documentary. He also directed Ghost World, Daniel Klaus's graphic novel adaptation. And he also more recently and more newly, I guess, um, like more contemporarily, some, some word insert the right word he also directed Bad Santa so there's that now when you watch the movie it pretty much paints him as a musician and then you start to see his art and when I first watched this documentary my jaw hit the floor because here's this dude who's a great musician plays all the music I love and he's a great artist, and he's his style was very similar to mine, like my cartooning style, very similar in that crumb kind of way. At a certain part in the film, he's sitting down with another old music great, Banjo Ike Robinson, and 
Howard Armstrong whips out this book that he keeps under lock and key. So imagine like one of them black bound sketchbooks, right? He whips this out of a locked suitcase and this book is is titled by him The Whorehouse Bible. And the whole book literally going from like A, B, C all the way to Z, he describes like different filthy things and draws pictures. There's a lot of writing, a lot of documentation in there and his art is amazing. And the Whorehouse Bible is something that you only really get like a little glimpse of in the in the film. But as far as the world knows, director Terry Zweigoff got this book. He has it. And a lot of people have been um, bugging him to somehow release it or do like a printed edition or do um, or do some sort of PDF version. Sorry, my mind just went blank there for a second. And he was always using like different inks, like you could tell throughout this whole book. And it's just a sketchbook, but throughout this whole book, it's ink, it's watercolor. There's a lot of pen work, a lot of like markers, like whatever he can get his hands on, he used. And I appreciate that element of art. You know, you don't always got to go to Michael's and have them bend you over the cast register whenever you want acrylic paint or a canvas or something. You know, get what you could use. You could, you could make something amazing out of Crayola markers. You can. It's just, you know, one is no better than the other, really. It's all about execution. Yeah, a Prismacolor marker might do certain things better, but you can get that out of a cheap marker. You just It's all about execution. Figure out a way. If it's not going to work the normal way, figure out another way. Anyway, I can't spend all this time. we got a long list. we got 29 names to go. So, check out Howard Armstrong. His stage name was Louie Bluey. Check out the film, which is also called Louie Bluey. I don't know if it's streaming anywhere. It used to be on Hulu. That's where I first seen it. It's, I'm pretty sure it's not there anymore. There are also clips on YouTube. Check them out. And they also have a Louis Bluey Festival. I believe somewhere in the South. I want to say Tennessee, but don't quote me on it. Look it up. It's a bluegrass rhythm and blues festival that they do every year. I'd definitely like to check it out. Um, this year is obviously not the year. They're probably not even doing it. But it's outside, so who knows. All right, moving along on the list, another heavy hitter, Ralph Bakshi. Okay, now, again, if you don't know Ralph Bakshi, you will probably know him for two movies, maybe three movies that you'll know him for. You may know him for his animated Lord of the Rings his animated movie, they're all animated, the movie Fire and Ice or the movie Cool World. Now those, for me, are not my favorites of his. Not Definitely not Lord of the Rings. I don't really go down that road too much. But earlier than that, he did a run of movies. He did both the Fritz the Cat movies. And we'll get into Fritz later. Fritz was created by Robert Crumb. And Bakshi made movies. It was a little shady, but he made movies of Fritz. So he did two Fritz movies. He did a movie called Coonskin. He did a movie called Hey Good Looking. And he did a movie called Heavy Traffic, which is my personal favorite of his. I love his animation style. It's very much old-timey cartoon style. Not too old, but like Bugs Bunny little bit of rubber hose, but more like Bugs Bunny, Looney Tunes, Tex Avery kind of thing. But with a very dark twist, with a very adult twist. Ralph Bakshi worked for Disney for a very long time in these huge artist rooms that they had there with like 20 guys at a bunch of different desks. 
drawing out frames or doing frame backgrounds. Um, Bakshi also went on to work on Mighty Mouse. He had some input on Ren and Stimpy. And he also did, if so, for my people my age who are listening, if you remember Cartoon Cartoon, and that was the project that Dexter's Lab, Ed Ed Netty, Johnny Bravo, um, Powerpuff Girls, Cow and Chicken, that's the 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 cartoon hunk that all the the cartoon cartoon was this project that all those cartoons grew out of. But there were other cartoons that didn't make it. They didn't get picked up to be a series, and Ralph Bakshi did one of those as well. You can probably see a lot of my influence, or a lot of his influence in my stuff to a degree. I definitely was influenced enough by him that he made it on the list. And he is still out there, and he is still working. You could find him on Instagram. He just did a new movie about Coney Island. He is a fantastic artist. And when you see his still his still paintings, not his animation, you're blown away a second time. Fantastic artist who's still living and breathing. One day I'd definitely like to meet the guy and thank him for all the great work. Now we go to a guy who is not still alive, but another RB. And this is Romer Bearden. So Romer Bearden now, we get to my collage side of things. Romare Bearden is my number one top two influence in my collage work. Romare Bearden was a collage artist and painter during the Harlem Renaissance. He did a lot of album covers. He did a lot of collage murals, small murals of collage. I like his collage work specifically because I like collage work that isn't random. I enjoy looking at collages that are very random and abstract and crazy. I like seeing them. I just don't like doing them. I like to try to make one image out of my collages that is a reflection of how I view things. A lot of my collages are very chaotic and they're very chaotic portraits of the world, of a situation. And that's how I view things. So I like to try to make them more uniform. And Romare Bearden was along that track too. He was a little bit more abstract than I went. But he would use intense creativity to create the human form, to create buildings. You could stare at his work forever. There's a very good documentary of excuse me, of Romare Bearden on YouTube. If no one took it down, I recommend you go checking it out. He is fantastic and overlooked and one of my biggest, one of my biggest influences. And I have a quote of him hanging on my wall, which is the function of the artist is to organize the facets of life according to his own or her own imagination. So there you go. Romare Bearden also talked a great deal about art being used to exercise the shadow out of yourself. Art could be an act of taking your shadow out. Let's get all young on you. Take the shadow out of yourself and throw it on the page. Splat. So Romare Bearden was a very interesting dude who more more should be known about him. But I'm going to do what I can to get his name out there a little more. Next on the list, Aubrey Beardsley. Might be a new name to you, might not be. Aubrey Beardsley was an English illustrator and author and another huge influence on me. He mainly worked in black ink. He did a lot of ink drawings. He And you look at his art, you could tell as soon as you look at it, but he was very influenced by Japanese woodcuts. Whether it was grotesque images or erotic images, you definitely see that influence in his stuff. He's another one who I can look at, get ideas for. I've done a piece of art. It's on my Instagram um, called Universal Order. There is a nod to Aubrey Beardsley in that drawing. 
So go on Instagram, find Universal Order, check it out. There's a nod to Aubrey Beardsley in that drawing, but excuse me, I'll let you find it because that's more fun. Next on the list, Pedro Bell. Pedro Bell was the illustrator and artist who did all the Funkadelic album covers. So now George Clinton was clever enough. So you had Funkadelic and you had Parliament. Normally you would hear Parliament Funkadelic. But they really were two separate bands of the same people though. Funkadelic was harder funk. More rock oriented but still with a lot of funk in there. It was more about the music, the musicians rocking out. I really like Funkadelic. On the other side of the spectrum, you had Parliament. Same group of dudes, but in Parliament, the singers were showcased more than the musicians. All the Funkadelic album covers and album art was done by Pedro Bell. All of the Parliament album artwork was done by another artist called Overton Lloyd, who was also very good, but I concentrate on Pedro Bell. He, his images were more grotesque. Here we go, grotesque again. They were crazier. They were more far out. He did album covers such as Cosmic Slop, um, One Nation Under a Groove. He did pretty much all the Funkadelic album covers until Funkadelic broke up in the late 70s. And his album covers would always grab me always 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 my mother had a couple of them and I would just sit and stare at the album covers and the art again I'm going to tell you hop on Google hop on Bing hop on whatever you want to hop on look up Pedro Bell art it's unbelievable and it, it, again like Howard Armstrong like Crumb like Bakshi he used a very specific style of cartooning when he was creating humans. If you were to get a Funkadelic album, you would open it up. There are almost always gatefolds. You'd open them up and there'd be comics, there'd be creative writing. Pedro Bell did all of that. And he created single-handedly before Overton Lloyd even came into the picture because Funkadelic started before Parliament did. I mean, if you want to get technical, it was Parliament. Then they couldn't use the name Parliament, and they switched to Funkadelic, and then they were finally able to use Parliament again. But Pedro Bell created the whole mythology, the whole all the caricatures of the band Funkadelic. Let me tell you something. They were doing that shit long before Kiss got a hold of it. Long before Gene Simmons... It was Funkadelic. Don't don't kid yourself. Long before those dudes put their makeup and started sticking their tongues out, Funkadelic was creating these characters in a band. They were selling you the music and they were selling you the characters. And that was all out of the mind of George Clinton, who was clever enough and smart enough to say, Pedro Bell, here you go. Run with it. So, another huge influence of mine, Pedro Bell. And we're going to jump to another gigantic influence. This one you probably already figured out if you've seen any of my artwork, Robert Crumb. So, without going on too much, Crumb started as an under... Well, he didn't start this way. He started as a greeting card artist, somewhat. And he eventually gained popularity from doing underground comics of the 60s and 70s. He was part of the counterculture as much as he didn't really enjoy the hippie thing. But he fit right in. And his art was all over the place back then. All over the place. You, The best example of his art, if you're a Grateful Dead fan, is the trucking thing. With the big guy taking big step. Here's the interesting thing about that, though. Truckin' had existed before The Grateful Dead. Not the song, but the term. 
trucking was a type of dance step back in the 40s. And that dance step is what Crumb is depicting in his big stepping dude. And if you look through Crumb's artwork, there's a lot of stepping people, a lot of people taking big steps. And that is what it is in reference to. Another thing, Mr. Natural. Sort of an all-knowing, very um, very zen little dude who got into a lot of trouble. Crumb created a bunch of different characters, but his style of cross-hatching and that comic, old-fashioned comic booky thing, when I first seen the Crumb documentary, it blew me away. And I knew this is the direction I want to go in. Black and white. I want to work on my cross hatching. I want to. This is what I want to do. This is the artist. This is the main guy who I wanna. I want to emulate. I wanna. I want to be like. And Crumb is still out there. He's in France right now. He still draws. Every once in a while, a new drawing of his. Makes it on his social media. He himself is not on social media. But every once in a while. A drawing of his makes it on there. You can sort of half follow Crumb. If you listen to the John Hennigan. Old time radio podcast. I might not be getting that title right. But Crumb comes on there every once in a while. And plays his 78s. But. He is a biggie for me. He gets controversial to some eyes. But art is art. And if you look at my work, that he, you know, you can say Howard Armstrong and Bakshi and Romare Bearden and Aubrey Beardsley, but they aren't as well known. Crumb is well known enough that I've had many people come up to me and say, boy, you really get the crumb bug or something along those lines. And I take it as a compliment because I look up to this dude and his art. Um, my, you know, you have these moments in your life, whether it's creative or not, when something comes along and just ping and it shoots you in another direction. And that's what Crumb did for me. Let's keep moving on here. Next on the list, Salvador Dali. Need I say more? His work speaks for itself. As I move into a more abstract and surrealist direction with my ink drawings, I'm always looking at Dolly's work, getting some influences, and also him. Him himself, the character of Salvador Dali. Because just like the other artists I spoke about, Dali was his art and he was his character. Go on YouTube again, look up, the clip of Salvador Dali on the Dick Cavett show. And it'll tell you everything you need to know about the way he carried himself, his character, the whole bit. Moving right along. The next one on the list is Jay Disbrow. I hope I have that. So Jay E. Disbrow was an American artist. He was a writer and he was an illustrator. And he worked extensively as a comic book artist in the 1950s. Specifically, he worked on pre-code horror comics. Now, I have not had too easy of a time finding his work in person, like books or whatever, compilation books. But a lot of his work exists on on, um, on the internet. And he is another huge inspiration to my art specifically when I get cartoony when I get comic booky that sort of thing so he worked his whole life but his main deal was his pre-code horror comics that were very very cultish very um underground ish at the time being pre-code his stories were filled with demons and ghostly apparitions and all sorts of other kind of monsters, his depiction of ghosts and monsters, his decisions that he made and how he was going to make these creatures look is very interesting from an artist's point of view. If you're into old comic books, you definitely got to check out Jay Disbrow. 
moving right along. Emery Douglas is next on the list. Emery Douglas was the main visual artist for the Black Panther Party in the 60s and 70s. All the posters, all the flyers were most likely made by Emery Douglas. All the real ones. There were fake Panther photos and fake Panther posters and art and flyers that were made to discredit the Black Panthers. So that's not what I'm talking about. Emery Douglas was the artist for the Black Panthers. I was able to see a lot of his work at a Black Panther meeting in New York City, up in Harlem. Um, they have some meetings and some rooms that they have up there. And in these rooms, they have a lot of original Emery Douglas paintings and things. It was fantastic to see in person. And his use of shadows, his silhouette work, his simplicity in making the characters and making it specific to the movement. I loved it. Blows me away every time. Next on the list, we have another musician, Duke Ellington. Now, if you dig enough, you will find out that Duke Ellington did paint a little bit. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. Naturally, if you've spoken to me about it before, I usually do my art with music playing in the background. And I've done many a drawing with ink um, <laughs> with ink Ellington. I've done many a drawing with Duke Ellington playing in the background. And as you'll hear me say again as I go through this list, it's not only his music, it's not only the fact that he painted a little, but it's his career. He never stopped. And that's something I admire. Another one who's not on this list, Woody Allen. No matter what you think about him, he does a movie a year. His productivity. High productivity is very inspirational to me. I would also throw George Carlin into this mix of just constantly working, constantly evolving. Never really satisfied. Always always looking ahead to the next thing how to make the next piece better, what to do differently. I really admire that, and Duke Ellington represents that on this list. Next on the list is Milton Glaser. So now, this name may not seem too popular to you, but I'm going to enlighten you. Milton Glaser designed and created the I Love New York logo. That's all you need to know. He also, if any Bob Dylan fans out there, he also designed the very popular Bob Dylan poster where it's a black silhouette with all the colors in his hair. He's done a lot of poster work. He's done a lot of jazz artwork. He's done blues. He's done everybody. He's done all sorts of musicians from Aretha Franklin, Lightning Hopkins, all sorts of different things, and was given, I believe, was given the Presidential Medal by Obama. So that's pretty cool for an artist, a visual artist, to get that. His work is fantastic. Like the other artists I mentioned, it sucks me in every time. He is somebody who should really be celebrated. And he also recently passed away. He passed away June 26th of this year. I don't want to speculate into how. It doesn't matter. But we lost a good one this year. And he is someone who definitely should be celebrated. And another artist like Ellington and like others I mentioned before, he never stopped. Always kept going. He was really fantastic. Go check out his work too. If you like the idea of combining black and whites with color, check out Milton Glaser's work. He was 91 years old this year. And um, once again, he is somebody who should be getting a lot more attention and should be very, very celebrated right up there with all the big names. Let me tell you, just because you do posters doesn't make you less of an artist. Moving on to the next name on the list is another non 
non another non artist to go along with Duke Ellington. This is Dick Gregory. Why is Dick Gregory on this list? Well, naturally, he had a lot of personal influence on me. I got to meet with him. I got to speak with him on many occasions, which was a gift, especially now that he's gone. But on one particular time of meeting him and sitting down with him, I wanted to give him a piece of artwork. I did this illustration of him and I wanted to give it to him. So I got up to him. I had the piece of art in a folder. I take the art out of the folder. I hand it to him and he takes it from me. Now, that's a big deal that he took it from me because Dick Gregory didn't take things from strangers. He was very particular and very careful. But he took the art from me and he held it in front of him. And I remember like yesterday, his hand shook a little bit and that shook the kinetic energy of his hand shaking and the paper shook. And he stared at it for what probably was five, ten seconds. But it felt like eternity to me. It felt like forever. And he handed the art back to me. And he said to me that artists look at things through a different set of goggles than everybody else. And no two artists have the same set of goggles. And he told me to never take my goggles off because they're a gift that only I have. And I get a little choked up even talking about it now, but I carry that with me. It helps me to stay true to me. It helps me to create my art the way I want to do it and through my vision. And that's why Dick Gregory is on this list. He would be at the top of this list for that advice alone. And amongst the many things that I spoke with him about, that to me I hold the most dear. I really do. Second on the list, another non-artist, Bill Gunn. Bill Gunn was a film director who directed one of my favorite movies, Ganja and Hess. So before you get pot on the brain, let me explain a little bit of background on this movie. Bill Gunn, Bill Gunn was a theater director and a theater writer. And he was getting some name to himself. And this was in the 70s. So one day, MGM, not MGM, I'm sorry, another film company came up to him and said, look, we want something to compete with MGM. We want you to make a black vampire movie to compete with Blackula. So Bill Gunn seen this as an opportunity to make a film, and he made the movie Ganja and Hess, but he went totally off the wall artsy with it, and he treated the vampire blood storyline he treated blood as if it was like a drug addiction, like alcohol or cocaine or crack. He approached it from that direction and sprinkled in all sorts of fun old African mythology. I recommend you go and check out Ganja and Hess, that movie, I believe, 1973. It stars Dwayne Jones, who you may recognize as the black actor from Night of the Living Dead. And it also stars my favorite actress, Marlena Clark, who does a fantastic job. And Bill Gunn himself is also in the movie. And the soundtrack to the movie was done by Nina Simone's brother. What do you know? Next on the list, Frida Kahlo. Well, I had a love-hate relationship, or should I say hate-love relationship with Frida. I, um, in school, I hated Frida. She was just this woman who seemed very self-obsessed to me. I did not know her story. In school, they would just throw her art in front of us and say, This is Frida, she's great, and you better think she's great. And I was like, I don't have to think that. I don't think she's great. She sits around doing self-portraits all the time wasn't until I was older, after college even, that I watched the PBS Frida documentary. And that's what changed my mind on Frida. Her whole story, her whole life, 
and how she just sort of didn't really have anything else. You know, she did a lot of landscapes, but the abstract, the surrealness, all that jazz, I grew more and more fond of. And as I was growing more and more fond of abstract art and surrealism in general, I found my way back to Frida, and now I love her. Um, so that's the deal with Frida. I love her work now. I didn't always, but the more I learned about her, the more I started to like her. Number 15 on the list. We're halfway through. Look at this. Henry Toulouse the Trek. Now, he is another favorite of mine. I got to see his art in person at the Museum of Modern Art. I don't call it the MoMA because I'm an adult and I could say words. It's the Museum of Modern Art. Enough with this abbreviation acronym. Enough with it. Say things for what they are. I seen his work at the Museum of Modern Art. And it was fantastic to see his poster work, his print work, his lithographs in person. Huh, forget it. And again, I see a connection with the Trek, Beardsley, Bearden, Bakshi, Howard Armstrong, even Crumb. It's the act of the pencil and the hand. The pen and the hand. I like it. That's how I like to feel. I I feel like, and this is going to sound crazy, now I've done paintings, but I feel like I'm too far away. I feel like I'm a mile away from the canvas when I paint. Even though it's four inches, three inches, at the most maybe five if it's a big honking brush. But I feel like I'm a million miles away. But when I have that pencil and I have that pen or that ink, I'm right on top of that page. I'm right there. I like to sit right up on the wheel when I drive. And that's the same way I like to do art. Number 16 on the list. David Stone Martin. Who is David Stone Martin? Well, Mr. Martin is an illustrator and he did a lot of jazz album covers. He did a lot of poster work as well for the war. But he mainly did jazz album covers. And I'm talking about the big jazz albums. He did album cover art for Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Lester Young, Billie Holiday, um, Ella Fitzgerald, a ton. He did other album covers too. He did um, album covers for some movies. He did um, a Porgy and Best 33 LP cover. He did a Woody Guthrie cover. So it wasn't just jazz, but it was mostly jazz. And again, you know, we talked about Pedro Bell and Romare Bearden doing album covers. That's one of the best things about vinyl, if not just for the music. And you could get into debate and you can get into the weeds on what sounds better. And I have my opinions on that, but that's for another show. When you can take the physical record and look at it and hold it and throw it around and hang it on the wall, you know, that's a 12 by 12 piece of artwork. That's nothing to sneeze at. You don't waste that, that space. And a good artist can make a great album cover. And that album covers in general are something that I really pay a lot of attention to when I'm exploring music. And... There are times when I've taken a chance on a record just for the album cover. And sometimes it bites me in the ass, but sometimes it doesn't. And it's worth the chance, you know, if it's not like a $50 album. Moving right along. I didn't realize how, how long this was taken here. Number 17, Wangichi Mutu. She is a current New York-based artist who does a lot of big collages. She does paintings and a lot of big collages. I almost did an internship for Wangichi Mutu, but she didn't accept me. And I think, you know what? I think it's her loss. If I if I can be a little arrogant for a second, I think it's her loss. I would have been fantastic. I'm a fantastic 
worker when I'm not being paid. I'm, I'm stupid like that. Number 18, Gladys Inco Ramos. Okay, who is this, you ask? Well, Miss Ramos was my middle school art teacher, who I always felt was very hard on me, but now I am very thankful for her and how hard she was on me at the time. I think a lot of that downloaded into my mind, and I still hold her teachings with me now. A lot of, a lot of artsy people I speak to don't like their old art teachers. They don't. And they've had headbutts, they butt heads with them, they argue with them, they, why do I have to do it this way, why this, why that? And I never butt heads with Miss Ramos, but at the time, I felt that she was very hard on me. I'm sure I've not spoke to her, but I'd love to have her on the show. I'm sure that she was, I'm sure she's seen a level of potential in me and wanted to get it out. And I would love to speak to her now. I've connected with her on Facebook and let her know, hey, one of your students is still doing art and he's crazy enough to try to make a living out of it. So she is someone who I hope likes my work now because she was there at such an early stage of my creativity. And um, I, as hard as she was on me then, as much as I didn't like it then, I love her for it now. Love her for it now. And her teachings are, are in my art today. So I'm looking at my clicker here and I'm already up to 51 minutes of blabbering. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to split this into two episodes. We're going to do two Shivers List episodes. And I'm going to stop here. Um, so you got 18 names. But as I look forward at the rest of the names, they're names I don't want to rush through. I don't want to rush through them. So we're going to do a part two to this. But... I appreciate you listening to this episode. I hope you got some enjoyment out of me blabbing. Hope you're able to learn something and maybe you'll you'll check out these artists that I mentioned here. And yeah, I really hope you enjoy it. And again, all the social media stuff is going to be getting a facelift. Instagram, at Albert Shivers. Facebook, Albert Shivers or the Albert Shivers art page, which is Albert Shivers Visual Artist. I hate saying my own name this much. And also the Albert Shivers YouTube channel. Again, I'm going to be posting a video very soon of my Jazz Ain't Dead art show. It'll almost be like you're there. You know what you do? You put it on your screen, you make it full screen, you sit back, and it's almost as if you're there. And Courtney did a lot of amazing interviews with the patrons who showed up at the show. It filled my heart with warmth. I didn't know she was doing it. And she was doing all this on my own phone. I handed her my phone. I told her the code and said, go for it. And I thought she was just taking pictures and video of the show. But she was interviewing people outside the gallery. And to come home... And watch through all these these interviews of people who came and liked the art. Really blew me away. And it was such a milestone. As much as a year ago I had my first art show on Staten Island. In my hometown. Right in my neighborhood. As much as that meant to me. This means more. It's a milestone. And like I said earlier in the show. For anybody artistic and creative. Every rung of the ladder we climb up is very meaningful and and a lot of hard work goes behind this and most of the hard work for an artist you the audience you guys excuse me you don't see the process the artist is entrenched in the process but all the outside world sees is the result and they don't really understand all the hours and yada, yada, yada. You've heard it all before. But a lot goes into this art. And to see people show up to one of my shows and like it and enjoy it and be happy with what they're seeing means the world to me. Like I said, 
I'd be doing the art anyway, but all artists want their work to be seen. All artists want their work to be liked. It means the world to me when my friends and the people close to me like my artwork, but to have a stranger come in and like it is a different different kind of feeling, but it still feels good. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Planet Shivers Podcast. We're going to be back every week now. No more messing around. I'm done screwing around. We're going to be back every week. I'm going to get Isaac's butt back on here. He could be my my Ed McMahon, but we're going to try to have a co-host every week now. If not, Isaac, somebody to fill in for him. But I know Isaac is a favorite. I've gotten a lot of people are into him and into what he's doing. So we're going to get his ass back on here. We're going to have a lot of cool people coming up on this show. And October, I'm going to shout it out now, October is going to be all Halloween horror-themed episodes. We're going to talk about horror movies. We're going to talk about all the things, everything. And there's going to be a lot of fun people on coming up in October. So stay tuned. Hang in there with us. Planet Shivers is going to get another upgrade. It's going to be happening. It's going to be tremendous, absolutely tremendous. So on that note, I'm going to hand it to Bessie Tucker to bring us home. Thank you again for listening to this episode of the Planet Shivers podcast. You can find this episode and a whole hell of a lot more on Spotify, Google Play, iTunes, the podcast app, Apple Podcasts, and with video slideshows on YouTube. You can find more of my work on the updated Instagram at Albert Shivers and what the hell you can find my buddy Isaac Wilson's work on Instagram at when underscore in underscore zen. I remembered it. Next week, another big week. We got big shows coming. I hope you're there for it. Thank you again so much for listening. I love everybody. I love you all. Thank you so much. You don't even know what it means.